Come on now. All right, guys. It is an absolutely <coughs> spectacularly <coughs> gorgeous, <coughs> over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this spectacular. It is now a Wednesday morning. It is February 2nd, 2022. It is Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day where that little rodent, I think, is so buried under snow up there in Pennsylvania that he can't even get his head out of the ground to forecast winter. <clears throat> Heading to 79 here today, 83 degrees tomorrow. So, uh... I have no idea why the entire planet isn't in the oasis of freedom for all kinds of reasons, but uh, I have a lot going on, so uh, I need to dive into today's chronicle of the collapse, but I just want to put one more uh, PS on the, <clears throat> the last two days I've been, you know, I made a two-part video about that excellent essay from Eric Rittenberry. And I actually got some thumbs down and some negative comments about part two, people claiming that Eric Rittenberry was peddling hopium at the end, and uh, I don't think so. I mean, if you heard my rant yesterday, I do not think uh, for one minute that Eric Rittenberry believes for one minute that any of his advice uh, at the end of that article was going to do a damn thing to change the trajectory of humanity in this planet. It was simply his way of saying, get out there and enjoy it while you still can. It is not a solution to the problem, but it is the only answer. Okay, the difference between a solution and an answer. All you can do is get out there and enjoy this while you still can before it all comes down. That was my reading of it, uh, but I might just be projecting. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, I want there to be no chance of anybody accusing uh, anything uh, they hear today of peddling hopium. And once again, I want to thank, thank alert leader, leader, <coughs> alert reader, <coughs> RC, the same guy who sent me the Eric Ritten, uh very essay. This essay that went right past my radar on counterpunch from a few days ago, even though I subscribed to Counterpunch, uh, I did not click on this one, so I'm very glad that RC did. And this is by a fellow, I'm 99% sure that Malik, M-A-L-I-K, is a fellow, Malik Diamond. And uh, this is going to be a long essay. I'm going to put the link onto it. You can read it yourself. Or I'm just going to sit here and read it until my battery runs out. But uh, take it away, Malik Diamond <clears throat> from Counterpunch. And this spot on essay called the BDSM Passion Play of the Capitalocracy. <laughs> I call it the Corporatocracy. But <clears throat> All right. Take it away, Malik Diamond. Several months ago, the famous liberoid Michael Moore published an essay wherein he pointed out that a lot of his fellow liberoids are secretly envious of the conservatoid neo-fascist who stormed the capital for having the chutzpah to make such a maneuver. I see what he's getting at, and I think he has a point. When life on Earth is the bet on the table, folks, folks who prefer to live ought to show such chutzpah. Of course, only so much chutzpah is necessary when you have got the complexion for the protection and you've got presidential encouragement. At this point, 
it feels almost cliched to point out that a more darkly tinted crowd would have gotten a very different reception. <clears throat> In the course of his essay, Moore used some variation of the term nonviolence approximately 253 million times. I counted. I don't know what it would take for liberoids and their sad cybernetic offspring, the wokesters, <laughs> to consider violence a viable option for self-defense and survival, but clearly the impending fascist conquest of the U.S. and extinction of the biosphere do not qualify. It, it was difficult for me to take Moore's essay seriously because, the time, because by the time I reached the 1,437th mention of the term nonviolence, I was already picturing him in leather thong underwear with a ball gag in his mouth hanging on a ceiling mounted chain and begging for more flagellation. I hope that image stays with you forever. <clears throat> Much has been said by the tattered remnants of the left, I would call it the left behind. Uh, much has been said by the tattered remnants of the left in this country about the sheer naivete, impotence, and apathy of liberoids who in the last 20 plus years have offered no meaningful challenge to encroaching fascism and industrial extinction. The first presidential election I was eligible to vote in took place in 2000 when the Supreme Court handed the presidency over to the most overtly criminal regime to ever run the country. Political rivals of that regime and every regime since then seem to have been unable to contest it with any more anything more serious than bitching and pithy remarks. If I may be so bold as to offer a tomahawk to this intellectual thicket, I propose that the core sickness of the libertoid personality is not apathy, naivete, or even raw animal fear. To put it simply, the BDSM passion play of the capital capitalocracy conservatoids are the doms and liberoids are the subs. Liberoids will never offer any real resistance and in fact are not capable of doing so because they are already indulging their fetish for the death urge, <clears throat> the victim personality revels in punishment and martyrdom. I've met enough leftish activists to know that many of them are way too excited about the prospect of jumping underneath tank treads. My view is that in the face of such overwhelming force, a wiser tactic would be to sabotage the tank. This view is not popular. The most deadly infection brought by European invaders to Turtle Island is not smallpox, syphilis, syphilis or even Christianity. It is Western civilization. No other culture has ever been as dedicated or competent in the realm of life destruction. They have turned forests into moonscapes, <coughs> made water flammable, disintegrated entire populations with atomic weaponry, 
and rendered countless thousands of species and cultures extinct. They consider such accomplishments proof of their inherent cultural superiority. <clears throat> Civilization represented everywhere by a physical manifestation of systemic hierarchy in the form of, pyram of a pyramid is based on power over. Power over. Subs and doms are part of the same cult. I call it the cult of the one ring, as in one ring to rule them all, as in J.R.R. Tolkien, literary prince of white supremacism. Shit rolls downhill. Those who submit to domination will usually exert domination over others at their first opportunity. They may not be willing to resist fascism, but goddammit, they'll shame you for using plastic straws. <laughs> oh, boy. Western acolytes of this cult hold a soul-deep belief in such false idols as progress, enlightenment, and rationalism. Their philosophies are abstract and incoherent, their spirits stunted, and their wisdom lacking. They are fundamentally alienated from their relationship with the rest of the living world, and they worship machines. When people who are completely colonized by smartphones and other tech fetish artifacts facts, go online to tweet about decolonization, there are giggles in hell. It is no coincidence that, as everyone knows, who is even slightly familiar with the sexual exploitation industries, the dominatrix is a popular service provider among rich and powerful men. That is, at least, for the ones who don't instead get off on choking, beating, and spraying bodily fluids on women and or children, you know, the Epstein crowd, and to think they call us savages? How useful can the liberation philosophies of a culture built on body hatred, ecocide, genocide, gynocide, chattel slavery, and technological alienation possibly be? These folks are one part human to three parts whips and chains. The great mystery blessed all living creatures with a will to live and survive. I'll never forget seeing, as a child, news footage of the Exxon Valdez oil spill where fish, seals, and birds struggled to live despite being so saturated with crude oil that they were barely recognizable. If you capture an elephant, say, to force him into performing as a circus minstrel, naturally the elephant will try to escape. However, if you chain him down so that he cannot escape, eventually it will give up trying, condition and resign to his fate. Even the mightiest creatures can have their spirits broken, but still, you never know he might go rogue in the middle of the show. I have always cheered on. I mean, even when I was a little kid, every time I saw one of those rogue circus elephants go berserk, you know, and trample the, uh, you know, trample uh, his torturer to death and, and go running through the, down the streets of the city, watching all these little panicked humans, uh, e even though he gets killed by the cops, we all know how the story ends, I have always been cheering on that elephant.
Anyway, back to Malik. If somebody comes at you with a baseball bat and the dedicated intent of taking from you whatever it is that they want, money, sex, thrills, etc., no amount of whining or negotiating is going to save you from a cracked skull. <clears throat> this understanding is basic to those members of our population who do not have the luxury of having their personal violence subsidized by state apparatus. The rich people in the hills summon the police when they feel their artisanal lifestyle is threatened. Others are not so lucky. <clears throat> An illustrative anecdote. <clears throat> My father, <coughs> a black man born in 1935 who spent his adolescence in Atlanta living on his own at the YMCA and hustling on the street to survive, has a certain story he often tells. When he was 12 years old, several other young men set upon him at his school locker to demand his lunch money with the obvious threat of violent rep retribution if he were to refuse. As is often the case with such packs of predators, one guy was doing all the talking and so was clearly the leader. Having both the street instincts and the proper will to survive, my father's response was to smash the pack leader in the face. The pack fled. My dad ended up in the principal's office. I imagine that in our current era, he would probably be expelled, possibly brought up on charges, put into a group home, and issued psychiatric drugs. Violence is, after all, the monopoly of the state. <clears throat> to put the finest point on it, force can only be dealt with by surrender, retreat, or counterforce. When the enemy occupies all tactical and physical space, retreat is not an option. When the biosphere is on the line, both surrender and the unwillingness to apply counterforce are tantamount to suicide, which, by the way, is the leading cause of death for Americans between the ages of 10 and 34. <clears throat> oh my God, are you advocating violence? No, and I never would. Violence speaks for itself well enough without advocacy. I am simply pointing out an unfortunate fact. I am not I am also not necessarily condemning suicide. Under certain circumstances, suicide is a respectable option. In dire situations, it could even be prudent. Furthermore, whether one agrees with their perspective or not, the people who run the machinery clearly consider to be violent such activities as labor organizing, blocking the construction of poisonous oil pipelines, refusing to leave one's ancestral lands, defending old growth trees, and being black. Thus, their enthusiastic deployment of cavalry, cops, and hired goons. If I were to advocate anything, it would be the value of life and the importance of survival. The ends don't always justify the means, but sometimes they determine them. As my Kung Fu teacher once put it in his delightfully succinct and limited English, maybe you don't want to punch and kick people, 
but sometimes people want to punch and kick you. Interlude. For a sample of three more or, or less verbatim conversations I've had in the last two years. Me to an indigenous elder. These fastest MFers are serious and they're heavily armed. Indigenous elder to me. <clears throat> With look of calm determination, slight gleam in his eye. We got guns too. Me to a black Oakland resident. These fastest, these fastest MFers are serious and they are heavily armed. Black Oakland resident to me with look of calm determination, slight gleam in his eye. We got guns too. Me to a white liberoid. These fascist MFers are serious and they are heavily armed. White liberoid to me with a look of fear slight shudder of arousal. That's why we have to vote for insert Democratic candidate. <clears throat> A little bit about me. I have breakfasted with former Black Panthers. I have suffered in sweat lodges with former Aimsters, you know, uh, American Indian movementsters, and I have seen land that was wild in my youth be mutilated into strip malls and yuppie hives in my adulthood. I have soaked in hot tubs in the mountain castles of Malibu, toured city walls in China, and watched cops per pursue fugitive vehicles at high speed through my neighborhood in East Oakland. I have seen some shit, but ultimately, I am just a tree-hugging racial mongrel from the semi-rural suburbs. I like bumblebees and sassy women. I write poetry, you call it rap music, and I draw comics. I don't use a smartphone, listen to streaming music, or talk to people on Zoom. I have trouble relating to the cyborg masses. I, oh, I often joke that I am basically a science experiment. I was raised an only child in a box in front of a TV screen. Compared to many people I have met, especially people who are brown and working class like me, I have had a blessed life of privilege and opportunity. I have done my best to use those advantages to be of some service to others and to try and figure out just what the hell is really going on. I study, I ask questions, I listen, I think. And what I am thinking right now is the infection is probably fatal. So, once again, who is Malik Diamond? Malik Diamond is a hip-hop artist, cartoonist, author, educator, and martial arts instructor, born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area. He is the descendant of kidnapped Africans, conquered natives, and rural labor laborers of the Scots, Irish, Swiss, and German varieties. He currently lives in Oakland, California with two brown humans and one white cat. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm really wondering, uh, I met a guy, this black dude, uh, from, uh, from, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. I was living, when I was living in Austin, uh, so this good guy, this was going on probably 16 or 17 years ago. This fellow showed up, this, this black dude from Oakland, showed up uh, out of nowhere in Austin 
and he just introduced himself to folks as Diamond. He, he just had one name, Diamond. He was hilarious. Uh, this guy, he was cool. Uh, and uh, he, he just came out of nowhere, and then he uh, just disappeared. And I often wondered what happened to Diamond. And, and, and I just a little bit suspicious that uh, this could be him, but uh, anyway, amen, Brother Diamond, uh, I dare anybody to uh, complain that Malik Diamond uh, is, is selling hopium, but anyway, to wrap this up I have company coming in for two weeks and we're gonna be doing a lot of traveling and whatnot and getting out there and enjoying it while we still can I don't know uh, my, my chronicle schedule might be a little uh, intermittent over the next couple of weeks but right now I am going to get out there and enjoy it while I still can on this absolutely spectacularly gorgeous Groundhog Day. Bye guys.